My guest today is Rachel from Grand Fidelity. And I asked you to do this video because you're Chinese. And you live in Canada now. And I want to know, North American audiophiles, how do they compare to Chinese audiophiles? OK, it's a very big question, actually. It's, uh, um, I can describe from my impression Okay. from each side, but yeah. they may not be totally representative. So first of all, I'll say this may not be politically correct, okay. but this is just my personal impression. Okay, of course. Um, let's say I worked in North America in the uh, audio industry for now, from 2006 to now, 13 years. Okay. I deal with, uh, uh, with Chinese audio industry from when they were suppliers in the beginning, because okay. I imported Chinese hi-fi to North America, okay. selling to North American consumers. Then now I um, help Western brands to go to China, so I deal with Chinese consumers now. Right. So I dealt with Do you want to mention some of the brands, though? Um, that's not the okay. right. focus of this, okay. Okay. <laughs> right? Yes, so I dealt with, I think of both sides people, the audiophiles, they love music. But uh, the way they love music are from different places. I think in North America, music, um, especially the audiophile generation, like a majority of the age group you, we see, when we come to audio shows, it seems like most people from 45 years old to 65 years old. Sometimes okay. you see even audiophile older than that. Right. Um, so this age group, I think uh, in North American culture, they, music was very important part when they were young. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, this has shaped their life, how they see things, sex, drugs, drug control, all these things. This never happened in China. Really? So when you see Chinese audiophile, what well, to this day, the, the Chinese uh, mentality or the social value system, they're still thinking the sex, drugs, rock and roll, sex is not mentioned, but you wonder how China has such a population, right. they're just doing it probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, and drugs are still, like even marijuana is considered very okay. taboo, okay. right? And then right. rock and roll, it's uh, not really, like I, I heard like even some of the rap music, it's not uh, uh, mainstream, it's kind of being monitored very closely. So the Chinese audiophile basically uh, they started from the area near Hong Kong because of the hi-fi equipment coming from the West. Then through Hong Kong, they have been smuggled into China when China just opened up in 1980s. Okay. Mm -hmm. So audiophile started, many of them started from there. And these people are, uh, this region also get wealthier first in China. When China opened up manufacturing jobs from there. So you will see that these people not necessarily um, not in academic background, mm -hmm. but they may probably in manufacturing in different academic background, different education. So they may never have official music related education, but they somehow um, made money, get wealthier, so they want to enjoy fine things in life. Okay. So hi-fi is one of the fine things in life. So, and the other part of the difference I find from Chinese audiophile versus North American audiophile, I find a North American audiophile very willing to search for information. Mm. Uh, they're interested in something, they go Google, they go compare, right. they mm. look at uh, this, who said this, who said that, and they compare, say, who do I believe? They try to right. verify, they try to analyze it. They do their homework. But uh, in China, it's very different. Chinese audiophile, in a way, well, at least the, the, the uh, northern part, at least they like to be provided information. I think it's this part of because of the political background, because people are used to live under central political power. Right. So you are told what to do. Right, right, <laughs> so right. you're used to receive information. On the other side, also because uh, um, Google is not available in China, so you cannot really just search and to get all the opinion. Right, right, right. So, and in Chinese, of course, you have Baidu, which is a different search engine. But this search engine, many information who pop up on the first few pages, it's all paid advertising. Then your, your information is very much influenced by the commercial world. And so Chinese audiophile, um, they, they, they wait for somebody to provide the information. But are, but are there Chinese audiophile magazines or websites? They, they do. They do have a website, but they don't have... Um, most uh, professional magazines are 
print magazines, but okay. these days nobody believes it because everybody knows it's a paid <laughs> oh. article. Oh, okay. And when I read certain articles, I also find that they are very marketing oriented, uh -huh. not uh, neutral. It's like a journalism. When we say China is the, the um, Journal, jur, uh, journalist that doesn't have an uh, independent voice. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, uh, in the commercial world, they don't have independent voice either because they're all influenced by right, right, right. advertising dollars, right, right, right. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. But so, here's the thing. Let's get back to the, uh, the mm -hmm. audio question. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we didn't touch on is, um, are there audio brick and mortar stores? Is that common in smaller cities? Is it just big cities? Uh, it's more common in China, actually. Uh, there used to be more hi-fi stores. Now it's, things are dividing. Some are uh, hi-fi stores, but the number of hi-fi stores certainly reduced. And the more uh, audio stores, which does home theaters, custom integration, all these things. Uh -huh. So these two things actually, are, some of them are blended together. But it, I, I recently, I think in June, I visited China. I went, went to visit a high end dealer. So you go to the front room, you have those Focal, every big brand, all the speakers, you'll see the full line. Uh, we rarely see those in Canada, even. The dealers don't carry the full line, the most expensive ones. Uh -huh. They don't carry all of it. But in China, you probably see more models. And uh, the dealer, then they have a wall on the side, they have the BMW in wall speakers. They said, This is my leaving. This is just for showing the hi fi speakers. It looks very high end, very mm. impressive, but the business survive on the integration. So hi fi also going through a challenging time. I think the same with the, um, the economic reasons, because in China, people retire a little bit early. And you see Chinese audiophile probably 10 years younger than in the West, we see. Because okay. yeah. it depends at what age uh, your, of your life, and then you become a more financially better off, right. and you can buy these things. So the, that's the, um, I, I think the trend is a hi-fi store will be reduced more and more. They become a more club type of thing. People have interest, they get together. Okay. Pricing is more transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, margin, channel margins could be squeezed more. And if they have a chance to buy from outside, they would. But of course, Chinese currency is not freely uh, exchanged, so mm -hmm. you cannot just take Chinese yuan and go to America and say, I want to buy. <laughs> you Americans don't want Chinese yuan because they have no use of it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, of, lots of these trade barriers uh, make it a, the, the store whether they exist or not. And part, the other part of the reason, as I said, Chinese audiophile like to be provided, like to be feed off information. So they but, go to the dealers, they want to ask somebody, they don't really have enough ways or enough motivation to search for information. But if in they're in a store, they can just hear it. They can say, what is that? Tell me about that. I want to hear that, right? I mean, as opposed to reading about it, it's even better to go to a store and compare a lot of products. But, it, but in the stores, what is the ratio of Western versus Chinese audio, audiophile oriented products? Not, not mainstream, but let's say audiophile stuff. Products? Yeah, um, speakers, amplifiers, whatever. For speakers, um, the, the low end, probably more of the Chinese brands and also some of the Western brands, the mass produced, like a JBL. Yeah, yeah. Mass produced is in the low to mid. Mm -hmm. And when you go to high end, basically just speakers, especially speakers, it's all, almost all uh, imported brands. So okay. you have a Chinese divided the speaker sound to German sound, to American sound, to British sound. Chinese sound. Chinese sound, uh, as I say, because uh, there wasn't much uh, live uh, uh, performance. So right. when the engineer tuning the speaker, mm -hmm. they don't get it right. When we were running retail uh, business, uh, sourcing products from China, my partner went there. He used, he used to run his own recording studio. He only find one model actually sound right to his ear. And that one confirmed by many, many customers. Yes, it's right. The rest of them, he has to bring it. Cabinets beautifully made, the drivers picked a very good name, but the crossover, somehow the sound is just not right, and then I have to change the crossover. So you have to redo the speaker. Wow. So Chinese speaker itself, um, I think they still need some time to know what is a live sound, how do you carry the emotional side of the music to the production of speakers to reproduce, replay this back, yeah, the yeah. emotions back. Uh, for 
uh, electronics uh, half half, electronics uh, solid state uh, uh, amplification, for example, from the West coming to China, very expensive. Why? Because you have to have a big support of after sale warranty services. If you have a resistor burn, a very small thing, but it's cost a huge amount of money to do it. Right. So the, the price has to set high in order to ship this big thing. And many Western brands, they don't want the service done in China because the Chinese just take it apart, reverse engineer, copy everything. So they say, well, we'll ship it back. Then this add to business costs, so it's getting oh, yeah. very expensive. Because it's expensive, then you have to have a Chinese brand to serve the um, affordable-minded mm. people. Mm -hmm. So in amplification, you have a two sides. You will find the Chinese two-band actually have a good percentage of market share because uh, Two amp, it's more classical design. Mm -hmm. They will take a very um, time-proven classical design. They do point-to-point -point wiring, and they do all the uh, transformers. Well, right. you got the Chinese person sit there doing wind the transformers. Costs a lot less than some guy in the UK from Audio Note, I right, think. Right, right. right. So the cost is different. Um, so, so you will see the store have a different percentage of it. Um, but in general, today's audiophile, they mo most aspire for Western brand. One thing is showing, yes, I made it. I think it's for self-satisfaction. So I work hard, I enjoy fine things. I enjoy something better than my friends can have. Mm -hmm. Or I just proved to myself that I made it. I celebrated my own success. Um, and then there's new people coming in want to enjoy it. They also uh, they made money other ways. They want to say, well, instead of do the learning curve, let's just skip all of this, get the best. So we find in China, many times the flagship model selling well, the affordable in the middle, it doesn't do anything. Right. right <laughs> Nobody yeah. wants the second best. <laughs> for, for industry uh, member, like I look from the inside the industry, it's challenging to deal with the Chinese brands. So some of them, because uh, they sell one set. In China, the value chain is different. So they sell the Chinese dealer in a different pricing. They have probably one layer only. So manufacturer, dealer, retail. So okay. you have one layer only. When right. you come to the West, you need a distributor, you need sure. a dealer, and all these things. And everybody's labor costs also higher in the West. So sure. you have to, retail price has to be higher. Right. Then in the West, the, the, the distributor, dealer did all the groundwork, do all the things, entertain, audition, everything. Then they find the customer, consumer. We are just uh, so cost driven, we go search on eBay. Right. <laughs> and uh, after some time, the dealer said, I can't do this, I can't do this, yeah. I need to make a living. <laughs> so it's all, many of the brands caught into this problem. So I think the Chinese uh, brands, uh, manufacturers, whoever, they needed to learn how to do business with the West and the East. Because today's world is no longer separate, it's, it's transparent, it's integrated. Although we have a great wall of China through uh, internet, uh -huh. <laughs> the great firewall of China, <laughs> trying to divide the internet, but it's still information, still flow. Yeah, it's, that is amazing because with all the trade, uh, you think that we would be we would be closer, you know, because uh, so much, you know, it is it is a point of resentment for a lot of Western <coughs> audiophiles that a company like CAF makes most of their speakers in China that irritates a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it just seems odd to me that there's a wall. There is a wall somehow in China that's stopping this, you know, this back and forth of, of music and the audiophile. Whatever it takes to be an audiophile, there's a, there's a disconnect there between our two countries. It's strange. Because it's very hard to say what is a music information only, what is the cultural influence. Yeah, yeah, and the, yeah, the, the yeah. Chinese side is still, well, it's also part of the Chinese behavior. Chinese as a country was very crowded and not everybody, because the information limited, they mm -hmm. cannot do their own independent uh, uh, ju judgment. Right, Sometimes right. they just follow the crowd. Right. When you have uh, many people who don't know exactly to analyze themselves and mm -hmm. follow the crowd, mm -hmm. they could go the wrong direction. Right. So right. the country has to monitor this closely. I'm not saying this is the best thing or worst thing, not from political side, but I do see this is probably it's necessary right now. Not saying controlling, but it just keep it uh, uh, under monitoring. 
I, I believe with time, let's give you another 10 years, it will for sure will be more available. Mm. But you cannot just not open the door, suddenly let everything in. Right, <laughs> it just right, doesn't right. work that way. Right. Yes, it's very difficult, very difficult. So yeah. I, I'm sort of uh, circling around here that if kids don't have music of their own when they're 14, 15, 16, when they're 20 and 25, they don't have the connection to music. Oh, now I got to get a really good system to listen to it. Is that is that a fair statement? Um, I think uh, when kids grow up, when they get to teenager, they all have these hormone-driven emotions. That they will find ways to release it, to connect with sure, something. Sure, sure, right. So in different formats. So in China. In mm -hmm. their culture, they do now. The Western music is more accessible, okay. and uh, English also is more common. People get educated okay. and read things, um, and of course, people find ways to watch YouTube as well because you can okay. get a VPN, or whatever. So, all these things, and uh, it's getting more uh, relaxed. They have a bigger okay. playground to develop uh -huh. themselves. So I think uh, let's put it the fast forward, give it 10, 20 years. So this generation. The, we call the the one gen, uh, born after 2000. So right now they are 19 years old. Mm -hmm. When they grow up to, let's say 25, 35, or let's say 35, mm -hmm. they have kids, whatever. First of all, in China, they no longer have this uh, huge pressure of a housing crisis because their parents all have multiple apartments. They don't need to oh, really? earn money okay. of it. Okay. Yes, okay. The, because their grandparents inherited from Communist Party. They okay. just get an apartment, right? So, I think the living. Um, the, the daily life uh, pressure will be eased, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then they will enjoy fine things, uh, they will learn it. I don't think there is an age limit to say what age you start to enjoy music, is it too late or too mm -hmm. young? I think uh, you can pick up when you're 40, you can discover something new. Sure. Um, so maybe Chinese just start a little bit later. But what about classical music, do they, do they take uh, you know, lessons when they're children? They all take a piano lessons <laughs> for violin, sure. Whether right? they are taking music lessons, that's a different thing. Oh. For me, I have a two. Uh, I have a cousin, my niece. Uh, they both uh, actually live in Canada, and I have another one in China. So uh, many friends, children also learn play piano, violin. Mm. Uh, to today, let's say mm. today, mm. they mostly learn it for a skill, so that they can have uh, extra points when they go to college. They okay. can go to better college. So it's very uh, practical reasons. Okay. And they are very skilled in playing piano. But uh -huh. are they very skilled in appreciating music? I don't agree. I don't really? agree. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. yes. It's a very skilled um, way. It's practical. I, I think it's not a touching emotional side. Right. They don't feel it. They just say this yes. is important so because the teacher teaches them saying in order to get a different uh, um, grade to progress in piano lessons your skills more important than how you uh, connect with music mm -hmm. like uh, you can listen to music passively you can know nothing about play piano but you may connect with music much much in higher level much more engaged than somebody can play piano but they may not connect with the music mm. People need, young kids need to be guided, need to be exposed to it, sure. so they can listen to say the same thing you play certain uh, classical music. If you have heard a good quality recording on good hi-fi system of uh, the same music, you will hear the emotion, you will experience the emotion. But right. if you never heard of it, mm -hmm. you just play the, the, the keys, right. then you don't, you never know what this music actually was created. And uh, I think the emotional part of the music carry on through generations, through different races. There's no difference of it. Um, so we'll see change. <laughs> Rachel, I learned a lot. <coughs> oh, thank you. Thank it's you. just another side of the world. You see the other well, side I of the know, world, I see I, the other side. <laughs> yeah, but you see both, uh, which is... Well, uh, that's confusing my brain. <laughs> I know, I can tell. You're a very confused person. <laughs> right. I'm joking. Right. Thank you so much. Yes. My name is Steve Gutberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. My guest today is the amazing Rachel. You've seen it all. You've okay. seen the <laughs> East, you've seen the West. That's the good thing, leaving two lives in one lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. You're, it's a different kind of buy. Yes. yes, yeah, yes. Anyway. I hope every audiophile here have an opportunity to go to China, experience the China show. You find so crowded, everybody talking. How do, could I listen? But the Chinese audiophile sit there, they just listen. Oh, man. <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you yes. so much. Okay, thank bye you. Bye bye. Yeah.